How much money do you spend on supplements and nutrition plans? How much time do you spend training to condition your body, build your strength, and improve your performance? Don't water down your efforts. Hydrate. And when you do, use alkaline water to maximize your investment. Alka Warrior Water is for people who work hard and play hard. Alka Warrior Water lets you bring out your inner warrior. Go beyond basic hydration. Alka Warrior Water balances and rejuvenates your whole system. You can find Alka Warrior Water at Retro Fitness Centers, GNC, Planet Fitness, and The Nutrition Zone. To become a distributor of Alka Warrior Water, or if you're interested in being an Alka Warrior spokesperson, contact Lou Ravenati, co-owner, call 201-600-2906. 201-600-2906. Or visit their website, alkawarrior.com. Drink up, warrior. Hi, Rob Fletcher here at ASF Podcast. I am here with Dr. Bill Kramer, my co-host. Again, now days away from the Arnold Sports Festival. And how appropriate is it to have none other than our featured guest today, Terry Todd. Yes, we're excited about today with Dr. Terry Todd, both a strong man of legend himself, as well as a sport historian of also unbelievable uh, value uh, as a, you know, unbelievable uh, idea to have today uh, this, this whole program to feature strong men and strong women I, concept. Uh, true pioneer of, of strength. Yeah, true pioneer and true scholar. Uh, Dr. Terry Todd is legendary. Uh, he published his first book in 1977, uh, Powerlifting, called Inside Powerlifting, and with no further ado, Welcome, Terry Todd. Thank you so much for joining uh, Bill Kramer and I today as we are days away from the Arnold Sports Festival. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. I did actually publish a previous book, but uh, that's okay. No, uh, uh, it, well, it, was, it was actually before uh, there was, you know, actual printing presses, so we don't normally count it. And what, was that, for, Terry, what was that, Terry? Uh, it was a book about weight training and strength training for athletics. I think he knows a little. I think he knows a little bit. Just, just a, just a tad bit. <laughs> that uh, these giants, uh, these cave trolls, <laughs> that, that seem to be getting bigger and stronger every year. They, they lift heavier and heavier objects. Not always barbells or dumbbells, but other things. Bales of cotton, uh, huge, bolted together constructions of timber. And uh, so we try to find different things to challenge them with that reveal who really is the, uh, the strongest. We, you know, I, in a way, it's a little bit of a stretch or maybe not justified to say that the winner is the strongest man in the world. But we like to say or, and think that whoever wins one of our events is the strongest man among the group of men we brought together. Because we, we really, it's not just me and Jan, we have a committee of people who are genuine experts who've been involved in strength training and, and strength history for a long, long time. And together we work out which exercises, which challenges, which uh, old records that from time to time we'll try to break. We've, we've had quite a few implements made specifically for uh, a, a competition that we hold. And uh, so far, uh, Bill Henniger over at Grove, they have done a wonderful job at providing just about anything that I dream up uh, to challenge these guys. Uh, and so they've done things that, you know, 50 years ago or even 30 years ago would have been considered unthinkable. Uh, and so it's been it's been thrilling to watch, and uh, amazing, and it's, uh, I'm grateful to have had a chance to 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 be involved with it, and uh, because it was about I guess 17 years ago when Arnold and uh, Jim Lorimer, uh, we had a dinner night or two before the event, and uh, and we talked about the world's strongest man show and about strong men from olden days, because Arnold knows a lot about that, and so does, uh, so does Jim. Jim was a weight trainer back, uh, as I like to tell him, you know, uh, well before the war. I said that's either the First World War or maybe even the Spanish-American War, but he's been around. 
around a long time. But he was, listen, Larmer was a weight trainer back in the days when weight training was considered by almost all authorities to be the worst thing you could do if you wanted to become an athlete, if you wanted to improve. And in any sport you might name, coaches back then, and Bill remembers this, although he's not really old enough to remember it quite as sharply as I do, because I was a varsity athlete myself at the University of Texas, and uh, uh, the man who was the head of the training program there, the conditioning program, he was dead set against any kind of heavy lifting. And uh, he made a, <laughs> what I thought was a wonderful statement once. He said, you know, if God wanted a boy to be bulgy, he would have made him bulgy. <laughs> oh my, oh my, he stayed on my case until uh, I was uh, halfway through my junior year. And finally, I just kind of got tired of it. I didn't, I didn't dislike him, and I certainly liked very much the head coach of my varsity team, which oddly enough happened to be a tennis. But by the time I was a junior, I weighed 240 pounds. And there was, at that time, this is a long time ago, there was only one man on the UT football team who weighed as much as that. He weighed 245, so I was heavier than any football player and back in those days, and I was a tennis player. So that lets you see the changes that we know now that we have primarily as a result, actually not of drugs. Drugs have played a part. But it's really been a, re re a relatively insignificant part. The big changes is uh, the level of weight training, systematic weight training. Now, recently, they're making some real gains in the understanding that sports scientists have about nutrition. And uh, in terms of football, I think maybe it's fixed everything. Uh, I'd be interested if Bill would agree. And that's back when I was playing tennis at UT, most of the boys played both ways. They played offense and defense. Well, I just, there are not many men in the world who ever lived who could play 350 pounds, which is what many, many, many pro linemen away and go both ways and uh, play a whole football game. Yeah, I think it's uh, really yeah. important, Terry, that, uh, you know, the whole idea of weight training and resistance training comes so far over the last 50 years. I know Rob had a few really interesting questions he wanted to pose to you to see what you thought about it. Uh, well, one, one is how has it evolved over the years? You said 16 years ago, Terry. Uh, how has it evolved? I know uh, Bill and yeah. I spoke uh, last show about how it's incredible how strong the, these, uh, these guys are. And now, of course, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, you have the strong woman. But how have you seen it evolve, and is there a training method that is, is a common training method among these athletes, or are there a variety of training methods that they use to consistently increase their strength yeah. and power? I think what's happened really is that when they ask me to uh, design a show and to run it for them, that they would uh, provide me with a great audience and they would take care of the prize money and, and other expenses related to the competition. But they wanted it to be, uh, at that time, the World's Strongest Man event was, uh, it had in it, not so much now, but back in those days, they had a lot of individual events within the competition that really were silly. They were designed by people who were television executives, who, of course, actually don't know anything about strength and how you test it. They were trying to find things they thought would be entertaining. They didn't really see it as a sporting event, whereas I, I've always seen it as a sporting event. Uh, they, they saw it as a TV show. And so they had bizarre things like uh, who could hang the longest uh, over a pool of water before their hands gave way. And, and I said, you mean to tell me that this is how you're going to test to see as, as the strongest hands? And so I, I could go out in Austin and in minutes, I can find 50 teenage girls who can hang longer than any of these 250 or 300 pound men. They can hang longer. Are there hands stronger than these giants? Uh, I said, so 
it, these kinds of things were silly. And I, I kind of explained that to Jim and to Arnold. But I also said, if, I, if I'm going to do it and it's going to be successful, uh, people might be a little suspicious. You know, if here I come, you know, some college professor, and I'm going to design this program, even if I have a committee. Nonetheless, I said, the thing that will bring them better than anything would be if you give a really nice first prize for the winner. And so you should, I know how much the World Strongest Man is paying for their winner. It was at that time, I think, somewhere around $5,000. Mm. And so I said, you should double that. And I said, you know, Arnold, something else. I know that every year, because you're in partnership sort of with, uh, with the Hummer, the automobile, they were just making the versions that were a little bit more user-friendly. And but Arnold was one of the first people to have one, actually maybe the first private citizen to have one. And uh, I said, if you're getting one for the, the little bodybuilders, for God's sake, if you get one for these big men, they would love that, above all things. This would just suit them to the team. And so why not get that if you think these guys who make them uh, would give you one that we can then give to the winner? And uh, Arnold said, well, I will try. And being Arnold, he tried and he succeeded. And so the winner that first year was actually a guy who I spent a lot of time working with as he was becoming a listing champion. His name was Mark Henry. He sure. uh, don't have a very, very long career in, as a professional wrestler, and he's still doing it. He's getting ready to retire. But, but at that time, even though he had not done any competitive listing for about five years, Mark is so phenomenally strong, naturally, that I thought he had a chance. And so when he told me he wanted to do it, I was surprised. I said, if you can get this man okay, then it's okay with me, and I'll check the back of to be sure they're okay. Everybody thought, well, sure, Mark wants to do it. He deserves to be in it, and he won it fairly handily. And they gave him the Hummer and the $10,000. I doubt if he still got the 10000 but he still has the Hummer, and that's the car he drives around. <laughs> off, off the Texas Yeah. Well, Terry, when, when was that? I said he went. He drives. No. A Hummer. Yeah. No. When was the, when was that uh, when was that, oh, that that he first brought that Hummer? Two thousand and two. Two thousand and two. Very first event. This is our sixteenth wow. event. Sixteenth event. Well, Terry, we're going to go to a short, short break. Uh, you're listening sure. to ASF podcast. My co-host, Dr. Bill Kramer, of course, the great Terry Todd. We will be right back. Join the mission, Health is Wealth. Fuel your mind, body, and spirit. Hydrate. Drink Alka Warrior water. Cleanse and energize your body. Flush out harmful toxins. Improve pH balance. You can find Alka Warrior water at Retro Fitness Centers, GNC, Planet Fitness, and the Nutrition Zone. To become a distributor of Alka Warrior water, or if you're interested in being an Alka Warrior spokesperson, contact Lou Ravenati, co owner. Call 201 600 2906. 201-600-2906 or visit their website alkawarrior.com Drink up, warrior. Rob Fletcher back here at ASF Podcast with my co-host, Dr. Bill Kramer. How you doing? Terry Todd. Terry, uh, to pick up where we left off, uh, I mentioned briefly, this year is very exciting, the first strong woman uh, at the Arnold. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. But there have been uh, strong women taking part in uh, other competitions, but this is particularly uh, a stepped-up contest with uh, Dion Russell, who is in charge of it. She's been really beating the bushes and trying to get some quality competitors to come in. And uh, uh, Jim Lorimer has actually helped her and has made it possible by contacting a an outstanding, really, I mean, really outstanding sculpture in Cleveland who, who's made a couple of trophies for us for other events, but he has made this beautiful bronze statue. That oh, must be two and a half feet tall, probably weighs at least 50, 60 pounds, and it's a statue or rendering of a woman whose name was Katie Stampina. And it's 
broadly considered that among the golden years of professional strong men, strong women, which would have been the latter part of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, she ruled the roost. And she really was. She was about six feet tall, approximately, and weighed right at 200 pounds, maybe slightly more. But she was built as the strongest and most beautiful woman on earth. She traveled with Ringling Brothers uh, at Barnum and Bailey. She was the center ring attraction, made quite a lot of money. But she was, uh, she wasn't just uh, someone with a big name. She could do things that a lot of, even back then, some of the strongest men could do. And she challenged some of them, the very top men in those days, like Louis Sear or uh, Apollon for France. They were, would have been too strong for her. But a lot of the mid-range strong men, she would have beaten them, defending horseshoes and uh, doing those kinds of, I mean, she used to pick up 600 pounds cannon up across one, sh one shoulder, not across one shoulder, uh, and she would walk with it around the circuit, around the ring. And they even uh, attempted to act at the end of her walk. They, they had it loaded, you know, with the first different kind of uh, stuff that you adding. They would touch it off, and the cannon would fire. And the uh, the challenges and the competitions of the strong women, are they similar to, to that of the men's, uh, similar uh, movements and lifts? Uh, well, of course, the, the passage is very different. But they're doing, uh, essentially, lifts that determine not just strength, but I think in the case of the women, they're also trying to reach toward uh, the demonstration of power. You know, someone can be stronger man number one can be stronger than man, man number two, but not be as powerful as man number two. And uh, power is expressed, for example, on, like a vertical jump. But so the person who can do the greatest vertical jump from a squat position is not necessarily going to be a person who can raise the biggest weight in a standard competitive squat. Uh, you know, it has to do it, Bill can explain better than I, with the explosive quality your body has and the way you train to enhance your power. And in sports, of course, as the expression of power is much more important than the expression of strength. But they're very connected, but there is a bit of a difference. Yeah. And so, uh, but the, the events they're having, I've looked at the events, they're very challenging. I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. To watch what some of the women can do. There are women now, quite a number of them, not not scores and scores, who can step up to 500 pounds. And uh, incredible. Believe me, I say that the average football player at the college level just cannot do a just 500, 500 pounds. pounds. That's for sure. And then this is taking place, uh, the, the men's is taking place uh, Friday, March 3rd, and Saturday, March 4th on the Arnold Expo stage. That's correct, Terry? That's right. In the afternoon, from, from 3.30 to 5.30 on Friday, and then from approximately 1.30 until 5.30. Those, those are longer events, and that takes place in the afternoon on Saturday. And then our final event will take place at Adele Hall. On Saturday night, very funny, funny. On Saturday night, uh, so the the training methods and, and Bill, of course, you want to the training methods. Yeah. How ha have they differed from one? How how are they are they very different or are people well, trained I think, I think, commonly? I think what happens is there's always with the strongman competitors, uh, you have to train in the in the classical strength, uh, power types of training regimes. But remember. As, as, as Dr. Todd mentioned, you have implements, you have different events that are going to require some training that isn't in the classic weight training type of genre. So I think a lot of times if they, if, if they know the event they're going to be participating in, they will then practice those events so that basically they, it's called strongman training, you know, and that's been a genre in the field of resistance training now. 
And sometimes many athletes try to use strongman training and it may or may not transfer to their sport. Because as, as Dr. Todd, as Terry mentioned, this is, a, this is a sport and it has its own specific demands and characteristics for the background to do the type of strength activities they're doing, but in construct also have the amazing strength and training that you do at classical heavy lifting and this type of thing. So, so it's so, that. So you feel most would be common practices? I think the, most, the most of them are going to be training with, you know, regular strength training uh, techniques and modalities and power training modalities. But then they have to enter in with the type of uh, training that's going to be related to the events they're going to be participating Specific. in. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you, 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 you basically have a, a lack of specificity. And I think there is some of that that's well known in the so-called strongman training regime. Uh, so One of the big things that, that has happened since the beginning is when 1977, I mean, 40 years ago, that was the first year that uh, World's Strongest Man show was held. I, I was a kind of a consultant on that show, but I didn't, they didn't contact me early enough so I could, uh, could have influenced the, uh, the actual events directly. Uh, that's, that's an interesting story, but I'm not going to take the time to tell it. All I wanted to say is that 40 years ago, the people, I mean, they had people from all walks of life, professional wrestlers, they had a big farmer, they had a guy who was a hammer throwing right. champion, and a couple of lifters, power lifters. But the, the thing is that most of the people who were the strongest were people who were competitive weight lifters and power lifters. And they did not, many times when they got there to the show and they saw the apparatus that the TV people and a couple of people that knew a little bit about strength had set up for them to do. They'd never seen these things before. And their their preparation back then was all together in the gym. They might have gone outside and run some wind sprints or maybe a run up the stairs at a football stadium. But what's changed is that now these uh, these men are were so phenomenally strong now. They there are many more of them and they, they come a more and more really big men. They see a chance to become well known and to uh, make actually a quite a good living. I, I mean, Tom Thor Bjornsson from Iceland, you know, he makes quite a lot of money now uh, doing uh, advertisements and what he does in the strongman world and uh, being a recurring character on Game of Thrones. Sure. He plays, uh, plays the mountain. And, and, and it's typecasting if there ever was typecasting. Half Thor is 6'9". Weighed 425, and uh, uh, last year Bill Kramer weighed him over no issue, and that's what he weighed. But the, the thing is now, these guys, our guys, more and more of them can train year round, and because they can make a living being a professional strongman, you really can't make a living these days unless you are representing uh, China, let's say. Uh, or in the old days, before the block fell, those people were professional. And, uh, but now people train primarily. They do some weight training, curls and, and the other things, bench press, standing press, squats. But the major part of the training is not gym training with barbells and dumbbells. Mm. It's done with, with what they call uh, event training event training. Mm -hmm. they, if they're going to uh, carry a, a huge weight on their shoulders, so this year we're going to ask them to carry 1,545 pounds across their shoulders, the same place you would place the bar for a squat, and these guys then have to walk 20 feet or so. I mean, that's a colossal weight. So they have to practice yeah. not squatting. They have to practice picking up really heavy weights and walk you have right. to practice what you're going to do. Yep. And uh, and that's the, that's the biggest change yeah. between those early days and that right. special thing. Yeah, I, I agree. I, you know, that's, that's really been it. Yeah, I think the big thing has been the fact that the now that they know the implements, 
they do have to have specificity of training. That's one of the characteristics of any sport is specificity of training. So a tremendous base in, in normal strength, power, uh, capabilities and training, and then you translate that to the specificity of the event you're going to participate in to really make it all come together. You bet. So, Terry, we were talking about uh, earlier, or yesterday I was talking to Bill about testing. And I know that you have a great relationship with uh, Dr. Kramer here in testing the athletes. So let's talk a little bit about, more about that process or, or procedure that the athletes go through. I believe it's post-Arnold? Yes, it's post-Arnold. And, again, it came out of the desire by uh, Jim Lorimore and Bob to allow the athletes to have some testing that they can utilize for their own personal use on a variety of different measures so they can take it and use it and use it as a marker for for their own uh, personal use and where they are with different parameters that we look at. Yeah, we thought it was something we could do. We always try to treat them very well. We pay more than any other contest. We pick them up in limousines when they arrive in Columbus. We really do uh, make them feel good. And so I think they perform better. And so one of the things I wanted to do is to set up a, a battery of tests that Bill would oversee he and his uh, colleague, and he agreed to do it, which was wonderful. And uh, uh, so we actually did it. It took several hours. And it, it, it would have cost, uh, from what Bill said, and other medical folks have, have said that certainly at least that, somewhere between 1000 and $1,200 per person to have those tests. Yeah, but uh, Jim Warmer yeah. and, uh, and, and uh, Bill Warmer from Rome, they, they agreed to cover the cost, and of course most of the work that the people at OSU did, that was a pro bono. And so I think in a way, the scientists got to see a, a cohort of athletes that had never been brought together before for any kind of medical evaluation. Four of the men weighed over 400 pounds, and, uh, they, and they were very interested in doing this is not a required test. I told them that we could set it up, it was available to them, that none of us would see it, I would see it, uh, the warmers would not see it, and uh, this would be something for them to take home to their doctors so they would know more about their health than they know now, maybe than they've ever known. Yeah. And they enjoyed it so much that, that this year, last year, everybody came. And I expect the same thing this month. So it allows them to create a base and they can see from year to year if what they're doing is helping them and uh, maybe their blood pressure is not looking so good, they can take some action. Maybe if they're, because uh, blood work is done as well, but it's a thorough, thorough test, and they can really enjoy it. They have a DEXA machine there. You can imagine, we can find out exactly what one of the enormous men's arm, one arm way. We can know exactly uh, what their bone structure, uh, how, how much their bones play. And in fact, we found amazingly, I can, I can share this stat with you because the man uh, whose stat it is told it to me and he said, no, he said, I, I don't, you can tell that this side. Yeah. This is the half floor Bjorn from the Icelandic giant, 6 nine, and four twenty. actually I, I remember that, 422. And at 422, he had a 17% that's just uh, absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, and I think I think one of the things that we we've done in uh, we're very reverent, and I quote reverent in all our laboratory testing because they're under the auspices of all the state, federal, and and laws and all that type of thing. But one of the things we do when we deal with elite athletes is we're very we're very we're very concerned about their privacy, about their about the whole aspects of how you want to put something together. So I think they appreciated the the, the whole phenomenon where we, we really treated them, you know, in a, as a reverend class like we do with our, our test subjects. And basically it, it wasn't a circus. It was something that they were going to use. They're going to get stuff out of it. Everybody involved is there to be of support to them. Mm -hmm. And that's really one of the, the classical things I think they appreciated about the environment they were in. Uh, I agree. And, and it's a testament, Terry, to, to yourself and to Bill and to Mr. Lorimer, to Arnold, uh, their true passion, one for the sport, but more importantly for the safety of their athletes because they are 
uh, putting extreme amount of stress on their body, and they train uh, incredible and perform right. incredible feats of strength. But this is something that's done on uh, Volunteer voluntarily, basis, uh, right. uh, completely. And uh, as you mentioned, Terry, the Lormers, OSU, Dr. Kramer, yourself. So it really comes down to the protection of the athlete and, again, putting it to, to yeah. them for their own personal use right. so that they right. maintain their own uh, personal health and, and well-being. Right, and, I, and they get the information, and it's, it's interpreted. We've had a great support by our medical community, and, and, uh, and it's really been a good opportunity for them to get it uh, in tests that normally don't come in a typical physical. Well, Terry, again, that's... It's incredible what you do uh, for the sport, uh, but again, I'll just repeat, more importantly, for the protection of the athletes, making sure that everyone's staying safe and healthy, and not only for themselves, but for their families. So, uh, Terry Todd, again, thank you very much for, for joining us. In closing, I want everyone to know, check out Terry Todd and the Arnold Strawman at arnoldsportsfestival.com. Uh, thank you, Terry Todd. Thank you, Dr. Bill Kramer. Thank you very much. Until next Thanks, time, Terry. ASF Podcast. Okay, thanks for listening. Time for a water break. Alka Warrior Water. You can find Alka Warrior Water at Retro Fitness Centers, GNC, Planet Fitness, and the Nutrition Zone. To become a distributor of Alka Warrior Water, or if you're interested in being an Alka Warrior spokesperson, contact Lou Ravenati, co-owner. Call 201-600-2906.